Okay, I think we're ready to start. Hope this finds you all safe and well in these very, very strange and difficult times. I'm Peter Maravellis, and on behalf of City Lights Booksellers, I'd like to welcome you to City Lights Live, the virtual reading series that continues in the footsteps of our in-store calendar during the shelter in place. We continue to celebrate the works of authors we know and love with readings, discussions, and forums throughout the fall season. So we're happy to announce that City Lights has reopened its doors to the public. Following CDC and San Francisco Health Department guidelines, we aim to make your visit to City Lights as safe as possible. So please do come and visit us. You'll be able to once again browse our stacks. We are open seven days a week from 12 noon to 8 p.m. We have worked very hard to transform the store for the age of COVID. The entrance is now on the Broadway side of the building at 271 Columbus, just so that you're aware. Uh, the original entrance is now an exit only. So we encourage everyone, please do wear facial covering while visiting, trying to make uh, every effort we can to kind of keep things safe for everybody. Um, so as many of you know, City Lights is a publishing house as well as a bookstore. We continue to publish in the grand tradition of Lawrence Ferlinghetti's seminal Pocket Poet series. We continue to produce on a seasonal basis, new books of poetry, fiction, literature, and translation, uh, nonfiction, all informed by a very progressive political outlook. Uh, we have new titles out from David Barsamian, from Stan Cox, also a very timely book from Alan Hirsch about our current electoral crisis. Also a new book from a 21st uh, Poet Laureate of the United States, Juan Felipe Herrera, uh, and much, much more. So to learn about the books that we publish, as well as all of our up and coming events, please do visit us on our website, www.citylights.com. You can also keep up on our activities on social media. We have a presence on Instagram, on Twitter, um, Facebook, you name it, we're there. Uh, you can also subscribe to our newsletter and kind of get weekly updates about all the events that we host and all the books that we carry. So I'd like to remind you, uh, this week is Litquake Festival. Um, if you haven't had a chance to check out the calendar, please do so. They've done an amazing job of bringing together year after year some of the greatest writers in the Bay Area. Uh, they have events scheduled every night running through October 24th. Uh, City Lights is co-hosting an event with them this coming Friday for the launch of City Lights author Pamela Sneed's new book. It's called Funeral Diva. Uh, to learn more about their calendar, uh, visit them at litquake.org. Uh, they're really, truly one of the important cultural hubs and cultural resources that we have here in the Bay Area. So support them when you can. Um, so tonight we are celebrating a book by a couple of authors we've had the pleasure of having in our orbit over the years, uh, I should say author and artists, uh, both Gary Camilla and Paul Madonna are no strangers to City Lights. We've been thrilled to host them in the past and we're delighted to be hosting the launch of their new book. It's titled Spirits of San Francisco, Voyages Through the Unknown City. Uh, it is published by our friends over at uh, Bloomsbury Books. It is a very rich and beautifully illustrated tome that captures what makes San Francisco the kind of place that it is. And I think as a lifelong San Franciscan, I can kind of attest to the fact that they've really done their best to kind of do the town justice. So the results are both very heartening and, and very compelling. Um, you'll be able to purchase copies of Spirits of San Francisco tonight. Uh, please do click the link we've posted in the chat function. Uh, that can be activated by scrolling over the buttons on your dashboard at the bottom of your screen. Uh, you may also use that same function to ask questions and make comments uh, to the authors. Uh, there's going to be a Q&A at the end of the evening. So a little bit more about our guests. Uh, Gary Camilla is a writer, a journalist, a historian. Uh, he's the author of the best-selling book, Cool Gray City of Love, 49 Views of San Francisco, and the historic column, Portals of the Past. Uh, that's going to be a podcast pretty soon. Um, it appears every other Saturday in the San Francisco Chronicle. Uh, he was a co-founder and longtime editor of the groundbreaking website Salon.com and the former executive editor of San Francisco Magazine. Um, he also offers these very unique uh, walking tours of the city, and he's available as a speaker about all things San Francisco. You can reach him at uh, GaryCamilla.com. Um, and then, of course, we're delighted to have Paul Madonna, who is a San Francisco-based artist and writer. He is the creator of the comic series All Over Coffee and the author of four books that include Oliver Coffee, Everything is Its Own Reward, On to the Next Dream, and Close Enough for the Angels. City Lights is proud to have published those first three books. Paul's work is about fusing together different elements that include text and images, concept and craft, 
thought and beauty. Uh, Paul's drawings and stories have appeared in numerous international books and journals, as well as galleries and museums. These include San Francisco Contemporary Jewish Museum and the Oakland Museum of California. He is the comics editor for the rumpus.net and has taught drawing at the University of San Francisco uh, and frequently lectures on the creative practice. Um, he has also served as an art intern at Mad Magazine for which he proudly proclaims he received no money. So gentlemen, it is such a great pleasure to be back in the house with you. Welcome to City Lights Live. Well, thank you, Peter. It's uh, delightful to be here and thanks to everybody for, uh, for joining. City Lights is a international treasure and I know Paul and I are just thrilled to uh, be uh, kicking off this book adventure at one of the great bookstores in the world. Absolutely. Thanks, Thanks Peter. I'd say it's a pleasure to be back. It's a pleasure to virtually be back. We all want to be back in that store. Right. And someday we will. Yeah, someday. Um, so I'd like to begin by talking a little bit about your work. So each of you has had a long running love affair with San Francisco. For years, you've been exploring your romance with the city through books, through illustrations, the editing of magazines. So I'm curious to know, how did you actually first become aware of each other, then meet, then actually come to this project? Well, I'll, I'll start first on that. Um, I, like probably everybody here, I had seen Paul's fantastic all over coffee in the Chronicle and was just intrigued by this really new artistic form that he had invented, this kind of Zen comic strip with these little, little tiny evocative piece, obscure pieces of San Francisco and this, you know, spare prose, very evocative. And so I loved his work. And uh, when I did Cool Gray City, uh, we reached out to Paul to see if he could illustrate it. So that was the, our first contact. And uh, Paul uh, wasn't able to do it. But I'll let, I'll let Paul take over from, uh, from that part of the story. <laughs> that's, that's a good place to take over. Uh, yeah, so I get an email from uh, Bloomsbury asking if I'm available for a project. And of course, you know, it's all very secretive. I have to say yes and sign NDA and all of that. And then they they uh, they tell me what it's about and they tell me Cool Gray City of Love. It's got a subtitle of 49 Views of San Francisco. I was like, well, you know, this is this is perfect for me. And uh, and I knew had known of Gary through Salon, and uh, and I was like, great. How long? You know, when do you need the drawings by? And they said six weeks. <laughs> and I was just like, well, uh, you know, that would have been great, but I don't. I can't. I can give you maybe two drawings in six weeks for this. <laughs> So, uh, so unfortunately, I had to pass just because the the timing. Maybe I had a little bit more time, but I couldn't do it in, in uh, the time they had allotted. But uh, you know, after that, I reached out to Gary and I said, "Hey, listen, you know, I I'm not passing on your book because of content. I'd love to work with you." And we, not long after, we were both at a Northern California book events, uh, book award event. Both of us were being honored, and, uh, and that was the first time we got to meet, and we hit it off immediately. And we shook hands that night and said, all right, someday we're going to find a project and uh, this is, and we're going to do something together. And it took, I guess, what, maybe five years for this to come back around. Yeah, it was, it was a, it was a while. I remember that we, we solemnly shook hands and said, we're going to do this someday, somehow. And we didn't really know how, what project it would be. And then it sort of came to pass because of the, uh, Genesis was the series you were working on at the Knob Hill Gazette. Exactly, I was doing a series called Quotable City and, uh, and it was a, a real sort of departure for me from Oliver Coffee because two things about Oliver Coffee is one, everything, all the writing was fictional and all the drawings were pretty much the opposite of anything iconic. My joke with those drawings were if, if I saw a group of people facing a direction taking pictures, I would turn around and draw what was behind them. And you know, the idea for me was that I wanted to show the beauty in, in the, the sort of forgotten moments, the moments that we overlooked. And that was Oliver Coffey really in a nutshell, but for, for uh, Quotable, I wanted to do the opposite. And, and because it's really challenging actually to draw iconic scenes because the viewer brings so much expectation, so much memory, into what they're looking at, that they see that scene so quickly and, and bring all their personal reflections to it. So uh, I sort of set out as a challenge to myself, how can I draw iconic scenes of San Francisco in a, and bring something new to them? And then rather than pair fiction, I was taking quotes from historical figures in the past 
that related in some way to that site around the city. Now, the, the, the research for that proved to be so incredibly challenging that even though some of the drawings were actually five foot wide for those, uh, for those pieces, the, the, the research was actually taking me longer than the drawings. So after about uh, almost a year, maybe under for that series, I decided I needed to retool. And I thought of Gary, but I didn't want to just bring him in to do quotable because that, that wasn't really fair. And it was sort of asking him to just pigeonhole himself. So I decided to scrap the whole series and I went to the Gazette and I said, hey, listen, can I retool this? And I called Gary up and I was like, listen, wh what do you want to do? I want to draw, I want you to write. And, uh, and he came over to my studio and, we, and I think within like an hour and a half, we pretty much hatched out the bones of it. And it was just about this perfect, you know, uh, you know, partnership, equal partnership. And Gary, I'm gonna let you take it from there. Yeah, no, I went to Paul's amazing studio, his former studio on Potrero Avenue, where there was this sort of mind blowing four foot high, huge expanded lens drawing of the curve, the famous, the iconic Lombard Street, uh, the curvy part of Lombard Street, but like you've never seen it before, like Lombard Street on acid is just like this unbelievably gripping and utterly original view of this very familiar thing. And we, we were talking about what we could do. And I said, yeah, let's, let's do, you know, choose sites and they don't all have to be famous and spectacular, you know, well-known ones. Let's mix it up, but we can have some of those. And then we can have ones that no one's ever heard of or that only, you know, a few historians or, or really obsessive San Francisco walkers have ever heard of. And, you know, let's leave it wide open. And the criterion for the selection will be what floats both of our boats, you know, so, it, and they both had to be floated. You know, there's no, no Paul float and, no, and, and a non Gary float you know, and vice versa. I had to be excited about what I could write and in some cases, I didn't really know, I have to admit, because some of the sites were just these great places that Paul found that were so visually and weirdly compelling. And then it was kind of like, okay, what can you find out about this crazy place? And other ones, I knew a lot about them already. And then Paul, you know, had, they had to work for Paul. And uh, so, and that, that, was a, that was a real educational process for me as we began to work on the book, because there were things that I wanted Paul to do. Uh, there was one house, one Victorian in particular that I was very excited because it has the craziest story. It's, it's probably the weirdest Victorian in San Francisco. It's called Nobby Clark's Folly. And it's in Eureka Valley on a relatively little known street called Caselli, um, you know, near Eureka 19th. And uh, I was very excited. It has a weird story. There's water wars. The guy that built the house was a weird kind of corrupt SF cop in the 19th century. There's no Victorian remotely of this size anywhere on that side of town. It's just a great tale. So I was all excited. And then uh, Paul, you, you, you take it from what happened when he went to scout it. <laughs> Well, actually, hey, Peter, can you, uh, can you make me a host for a moment so I can screen share? Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm going to show the drawing of this. And that can, uh, we can see the Victorian on there. So this is uh, the Haas Lilienthal house. And ultimately, this is the Victorian we chose because when we were going through and doing the the, the list of sites. And, uh, you know, Gary's right. What we did is instead of doing all iconic, we would sort of go A, B, A, B. And, um, and which is great for me, because again, I love do, doing, drawing the sites that are non-iconic um, and really bringing something to them. But, you know, we, we knew we had to have a Victorian in this book. And as fascinating as uh, Nobby Clark's Folly is and would have been to do, there was just no light on the building. Like I went to scout it. I, you know, I, I always keep a, there's a compass on my phone. It's like my, the, the app that I use the most when I'm out drawing because I just tracked where the sun would go across the sky and, and uh, the trees and the landscape. And there was no way that that building was ever going to get any light on it for me to draw. 
And so I went back to Gary and I said, listen, without any shadow, I, you know, it's, it's not going to be a very robust drawing. And, um, and I just, I, I'm sorry, but I got to pass on it. And so uh, we went through our list and we picked Hostel Lilienthal, which certainly has great stories to tell and, and is by no means a like second rate choice. Um, but I'm, I'm showing the drawing because I think what makes this pop is also these beautiful shadows that are coming off uh, the, the turret and you can see them falling down the front part of the building, which would otherwise just sort of be this flat section and falling over the stairs. And so, you know, that was one of the beautiful parts of, of our partnership was that um, we both agreed that neither of us would be attached to any choice if it didn't work for the other, you know, if, our, if it didn't float our boats. And I think that's the best part of collaboration, really. Um, and I'm going to uh, stop screen sharing. So Peter, if you want to take me off. Um, I think that's the best part of collaboration, really, is that you, you take your ego out of it. And you say, you know, I, I respect the, the partner that I'm working with, and I know that I'm respected back. And so we're really working towards a whole. And I think from the moment we met in my studio and talked about how can we make this series, and again, when we were working on uh, retooling the series for the Gazette, we also said, you know, we're going to make this a book. So let's work for this bigger picture. And we're going to allow figuring out how we work together month to month uh, to, to figure out our rhythms and understand our back and forth. And, uh, and you know, luckily, Gary is incredibly easy to work with. Uh, so I, I found that to be just smooth sailing. And uh, I hope and think it was the same for him. But uh, the, the idea was that we always had this bigger picture in mind. What are we making? What is the serious spirits of San Francisco? What is this book? What is this collection? And so, you know, it makes it really easy. If you're, if you're focused on what the final film is going to be, you're willing to cut any scene and leave it on the cutting room floor. Yeah, and I'll just add that, you know, for a writer, uh, you know, I've, I've worked as a magazine journalist and editor for decades, and you do get to collaborate as a, as a magazine writer with the art department. But this kind of collaboration at this depth uh, was really unique. And I have to say, I really dug it because writing is a pretty solitary endeavor. And you know, anything that gives you the opportunity to work with somebody and then work with somebody who you totally respect is just like a fantastic, unusual thing for a, for a writer. So it was really a uh, real joy. And, uh, and then the process, you know, we, uh, we should talk a little about the, the, you know, we did a lot of scouting. We would go out and drive around San Francisco in these sort of random ways and, you know, go out to strange, obscure industrial zones and, you know, go into places where we weren't supposed to be, you know, looking for something that was going to be great visually and have a great story. We'd get kicked out. You know, we, we like went into some places that were physically kind of dangerous, you know, collapsing piers. We were walking around and all of a sudden there's like a four foot hole going directly down into the bay. That was for our, we had a chapter on Pier 24 that I think uh, we're going to talk about a little later and see the art for. But uh, we kind of went through one of the uh, those big rolly doors on those old piers and we got out onto this collapsing old railroad siding and it, it was definitely we did not meet OSHA standards, but we ended up using using that that site, although we used it of uh, the a view from from uh, from the Embarcadero, not from the inside. Um, but yeah, the whole process of scouting things was really fun. And, you know, we 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 had we had a lot of you know strange adventures when we were in Pier 24. Uh, in that shed, I guess it was Pier 26, actually, there was like, there was a sort of a place where fishermen keep all their pots and nets. And there was a truck sitting there with a woman who was like chain smoking inside the truck with a seagull inside the truck. And you were just like, what is this? You know, so we, we saw a lot, a lot of, of strange stuff that never made it into the book, but maybe the ambiance of some of that seeped into it. Uh, and the sort of the edginess and trying to find things that were, uh, you know, really the underbelly in some cases, things that people don't notice, don't see, and certainly don't understand or know what the historical significance is. So uh, it was a kind of a, a wacky treasure hunt 
uh, in in that way, and it was it was really fun. So I, I, Peter, I'd, I'd love to have you talk a little bit about the aura of San Francisco. What is it? I mean, what are the elements that make San Francisco, San Francisco? I mean, if you had to identify them, what would they be? Mm. Paul, do you want to go first? Sure. I, you know, it's funny because the, the aura, I, is it something that, um, that resides with you or the, the thing that you encounter the first time? And, uh, it, you know, it, it's interesting. There, there's sort of several answers I can give here. And one of the things that I love about San Francisco and the Bay Area in a really just general sense is the air. And it's something that, you know, the fires over the past month really just, mm -hmm. it brought to the surface for me because I, I love to travel. I do a lot of traveling, but whenever I come back, it's the first thing that hits me. You know, I'm in SFO and I step outside and it's always that cool, fresh ocean air, the fog air that just it's cleaner than anywhere I've been, whether I've been in the tropics or, you know, but if I've been in crazy cities, it's, you know, not, but um, the it's, so there's this feeling of, of just like breathing in the city. And it's been really interesting to, especially during COVID when we've been locked down and we have a lot of our sort of enjoyment of what the city can, can give to us, have that taken away to, for a period to also have the air taken away. Um, but then there's the other the sort of more on, on the ground or which is that you can, the neighborhoods are like personalities and they butt right up against each other. You know, a lot of other cities, there's always this sort of in between gray area. You walk like five blocks and that's the connection between one neighborhood and another. And it's just sort of this no man's land. But in San Francisco, you're on one side of the street, you're in this neighborhood and you cross over and you're in another neighborhood. They just... I, and I think maybe it's a product of uh, just geography that we have such a tight area that um, that we, we don't get to have any in-between zones. And so that personality is, is really, it's like, it's like a crowded room, but in a wonderful way. Mm. Yeah, I'll, <clears throat> I'll take a stab at the answering the aura question with a, a brief passage from the, uh, from the preface to the book, which is, called Deserted City of the Heart, How I Learned to Look at San Francisco Under Quarantine. So I'm, I'm talking about how I was walking around right after having a knee, re knee re replacement surgery. And I'd only been home from like really being laid up for six days when the city was closed. So right at that time I was able to start walking and I walk out like the day that London Breed announces the sheltering in place and the city's completely deserted. So I have this sort of intoxicating frisson, this sort of surreal Dekirico city is opening up in front of me. Uh, and then, I, so I, I'm talking about uh, picking it up from there. But beyond the joy of my recovery and the otherworldly frisson of the deserted streets, there was a deeper, more familiar reason for my intoxication, San Francisco's sheer physical beauty. City dwellers rush to nature to get away from the depressing realities of the coronavirus. In San Francisco, you can do that by opening your front door. As a result, you don't notice the quarantine as much here as in other cities. New York is an utterly human hive an empty Broadway violates the essence of the city. In San Francisco, a deserted street seems to open a window to the place's deepest heart. The sublime terrain tends to swallow up everything else, including people. The hills, the bay, the sky, the sea are constantly overpowering the human one here. Down any street, some unknown hill or patch of mysterious water appears in the distance and everything else arranges itself around that enticing mystery. Every street is already a Dekirico. There is something that feels sublimely empty about this city, even when it's full of people. So that is, uh, you know, that's always been my primary take on San Francisco is as a physical place. Uh, that's what I think sets it apart. It obviously has this long, rich, romantic, troubled, crazy history. But uh, I think that what really makes it unique among world cities is its uh, topography. 
And, uh, and that is something that, as I say in this preface, was a real solace and a kind of a, you know, almost an intoxication when, when the, the human city is taken away from you. Ultimately, I, in the preface, I do, I'm not just staying there glorying in the isolation of the empty city. Um, the city actually needs both sides. And without city lights, without Cafe Trieste, without SF Jazz, without being able to visit friends, without a million things, it's a beautiful stage set. And, you know, I may have a greater tolerance for a beautiful stage set than a lot of people do, but it's, uh, you need the living city. And so uh, I think, uh, you know, both, both, both are the essence of San Francisco. Paul? Uh, or back to me again? Yeah, what are your, what are your responses to that? <laughs> well, I, the, it's, it's interesting that we're talking about the, the empty city because I, I take people and cars out of my drawings. And so there was this sort of weird, eerie, um, you know, where as we were putting the book together of like, you know, these empty drawings are a little too, they're hitting a little too close to home. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's, it's that aura is, and maybe it's better shown in my drawings. Uh, actually, can we can we show a few? I'm going to screen share yeah. again. Yeah, let's do that. Um, so I can talk about that. And again, it's about the light. It's about the quality of light and shadow. And uh, what's interesting is, um, give me one second. So this is a uh, pier 24 that Gary was talking about. Um, what's interesting is that when I was st first started drawing San Francisco, I didn't think about where I positioned myself in relation to a scene. And it wasn't until I started traveling and drawing in the same style that I realized that every city sort of dictates how far away or how close you need to, to stand from it because of, of the way that city is built, the way that the architecture interacts with the street and the way that the, the people uh, just sort of naturally, uh, unconsciously interact with the architecture. And, you know, Gary was talking about us scouting and uh, I, have, I have a lot of great things about to say about us scouting. And one of them was that I might look at a, a scene. We, we would go to certain places where uh, we had on our list that Gary might have some great stories for, or I said, hey, I, I'm interested in drawing this and um, would show up and, and I'd say, oh, wow, this composition is, is really grabbing me. And Gary would say, oh, well, the story I have is sort of more about this. Like, and so we had to find the area where the story overlapped versus a, a beautiful composition would overlap. And it forced me to do exactly what I had set out to do in the very beginning uh, of Quotable and then moving on to Spirits, which was to look at the city differently. And it's a real challenge. You know, How do you work in the same place with the same materials through your same eyes, but see it differently? And and by looking through Gary's lens and through the lens of the stories that, that he knew just so well, could recite them almost like his own family history, um, I found that I had to reposition myself. And that was really, really wonderful. It helped me keep my eyes open. Uh, and in a drawing like this, it encompasses so many elements of the city, you know, the Bay Bridge, looking out the pier, the old, uh, the railroad tracks that are underneath that, that used to be part of this pier. And then of course, the, the light and shadow play. And so, uh, you know, for us to be able to find this confluence where each of the things that we both loved fell over top of each other, that I think was the most exciting part of, of, um, of being able to see the city anew. Um, I'm gonna show you another drawing, which this is Shipley Street. So uh, I believe Gary is going to maybe read something from Pier 24 or maybe read about yeah. Shipley. Yeah, yeah. both, so, both um, maybe, yeah. So um, this was another one that I hadn't known about and was so, so exciting for me because when you hear the story, you I think you'll automatically be grabbed by it. But Gary took me here and immediately I just honed in on this building and there were a handful that I could have drawn. But, uh, you know, actually the, the, this was from the very day that we were scouting. I didn't have to go back and look for different light. It was like we showed up at the perfect time. I took some reference photos and I just said, I'm coming back here tomorrow to draw. So uh, I've got more images, but I think going back and forth will be a little better. So um, Gary, do you want to talk about either of those? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. maybe I'll just read a little bit uh, the beginning of the Pier 24 uh, chapter. Um, so that, that magnificent drawing with the Bay Bridge straight overhead. 
Uh, this is chapter two in the book, uh, Port City. Uh, today, San Francisco's Embarcadero is a magnificent promenade. The two mile stretch between Oracle Park and Pier 39, which passes under the mighty Bay Bridge and past a procession of grand gray finger piers with the ever changing spectacle of the Bay as a backdrop is one of the great waterfront strolls in the world. But it is impossible to walk along this clean, peaceful, park-like waterfront without regretting the loss of the old, dirty, noisy, smelly, chaotic, dangerous one. The city front, as the Embarcadero used to be called when it was the city's front door, was not glamorous. In fact, much of it was downright ugly, except at night when it became ineffably romantic. But it was real. It was a working port. For more than a century to walk from, say, the mouth of Mission Creek to the piers at the foot of Telegraph Hill was to witness the humming and grinding and gear shifting of a vast, intricate, glorious, rusty machine. Take the year 1933. In the darkest depths of the depression, 7,000 ships pulled in and out of the city's 82 piers. Weather beaten vessels from Liberia and Japan and New York loaded and unloaded their cargo. State Beltline trains hissed and clanged and crashed next to the piers. Winches and cranes performed their intricate ballet. Smells of copra, dried coconut meat, and coffee and sugar and rotting piers and mud drifted past the ferry building as thousands of truck drivers and sailors and shipping line executives and office workers and longshoremen poured in and out of the city. So that's the uh, intro to the, the Pier 24 drawing. And then it goes on in this book, just to give a little sense of what is in the book, uh, most of these chapters of the 16 chapters, Paul did 16 drawings. Um, there are anywhere from five to eight or nine, what we call vignettes. They're not full chapters, um, but they're, you know, they're shortish um, descriptions, accounts of a whole sort of galaxy of historical events and associations and interesting things that happened at this site. Um, and they range from pretty well known, but I try to you know, elucidate them in an original way to really obscure and really odd. And so that was one of the really fun things about this book was being, it's almost a little bit like 12 tone composing. You've got like 16 sites, find a bunch of interesting things that are gonna line up, you know, in your row of, of you know, your, your tonal rows of, of history. And, uh, and in some cases, um, as I, I think I mentioned before, Paul would choose a site. The, probably the most interesting example was he chose a place that was pretty near his old studio called the Rock House. And it's uh, in a really weird part of Potrero Hill. And uh, I'd never, if I'd seen this place, it had gone out of my mind. I probably had seen it at some point. And I had no idea what the story of this place was. And, but luckily, or, you know, whatever, I was able to find a really crazy story about it. Paul, do you want to show that one if you have that lined up? Yeah. Yeah, so um, give me a second to get this up. But uh, my, this is actually about two blocks from my previous studio, which is where uh, Gary first came to meet me uh, on just on the edge of Potrero Hill. And, you know, I would just take walks in the afternoon sometimes, especially if it was uh, a nice day and sunny day so that I could get some potential reference photos for, for future drawings. And I came across this house and I couldn't believe I had never seen it before. It's literally one block off of Potrero Avenue. And for, you know, all my years of, of being in San Francisco and even in my time in that studio, I hadn't found it. So I told Gary, I was like, I really want to draw this house. Do you know anything about it? And I sent him a reference photo and he said, I have no idea, but he looked it up and there was all this great history to it. And I think that was one of the, it's, 
it's like the the back and forth in the way that he he introduced me to Shipley Street and I found something that I could really draw that I would have wanted to draw on my own had I come across it. And then I could pass something off to him and, and he could find a story and would say, yeah, I'm, I'm really interested in learning about this and writing about it. And I think that's part of what makes this book so unique from other history books is because we did look through each other's lenses. And so we're getting not just the visual perspective of from me, but we're get and and the writing perspective of Gary, but the reverse from each of us as well, because I would draw things that I might not have otherwise, and Gary wrote about things that he might not have otherwise. Yeah, and this that particular side, as you could see from that fantastic drawing, um, this is a enormous. I think it's seven thousand square foot house that sits on what is without a doubt the largest rock platform under any residence in San Francisco. It's like a half of a block. And it's, that's, it's called serpentine or serpentinite. It's the, uh, the California state rock. And it's a rock that you find running in this diagonal line across San Francisco. So that's, this building is actually called the rock house. And it turns out that it just has this extraordinary history um, this, you know, this very famous San Francisco architect who really began the anti-Victorian movement, a guy named Joseph Worcester, who built two very famous, they look like wood shingled houses in Berkeley. I grew up in Berkeley, so they're, they didn't look like anything unusual about them, but they're in all of the, all the architectural history books because they were the great revolt against Victorian excess which was also championed by the great architect Willis Polk. And these buildings are on the dead end block of Vallejo on top of Russian Hill. But this guy, Joseph Worcester was also this very philanthropic, interesting spiritual man who started this organization called the Society for Helping Boys. And that rock house was originally built as this you know, home for sort of neglected or orphaned working class boys. Uh, and then it, then fell through a very strange series of events. It became a male dormitory for SF State in the 1950s. Uh, really bizarre. This is when SF State was located over on like Waller Street before they moved out to the western part of the city. And then the weirdest incarnation of all, this eternal ageless art director and designer named Rudolf Schaefer uh, had this had had a big big art studio in Chinatown, but he he and then he had one in North Beach, and he he had to leave. He was going bankrupt. He was like seventy five years old. He went to see a psychic. He said, "I need to find a house," you know. And uh, the psychic said, "I see an abandoned house on on next, you know, with a bunch of broken windows uh, near a freeway." And it turned out to be the rock house. And he, this, Rudolf Schaefer then moved into this house. So he occupied it for decades. Then it became, now it has fallen into contemporary San Francisco real estate. So some wealthy New York art dealer or somebody bought it for like $3 million a few years ago. And then that was a good investment because then he sold, now it's valued at $7.7 .7 million. And it's got a great room uh, that's like 30 feet high. And what's interesting, next time you're driving 101, the reason this building is so odd and that it's so peculiar is it's on this orphaned part of Potrero Hill because when they put 101 through, if anyone has driven 101, you'll notice that it, it cuts right through Potrero Hill. And there's this little orphaned part of the hill around Utah, Mariposa, San Bruno streets. And that's why nobody knows this house because there's no real reason to go up there. There's actually a walkway from the block that crosses over the freeway. And so it's just geographically, it's a really strange part of town. Anyway, this was all this great serendipity of being given this gorgeous, weird visual that Paul rightfully wanted to draw that I knew nothing about. And then, uh, you know, luckily it turned out to have this completely bizarre history. So I think Paul's right. This is one of the things that really makes this book unusual and fun are those kind of just sort of, you know, almost random collisions where, you know, neither of us necessarily knew what we were going to come up with when we started. 
And uh, that, that can be really stimulating and, and just surprising results. You know, this is just something that I don't think anybody knew much about this building. And it's just a, you know, I don't know how much good it'll do anyone to know this, but I enjoyed it. So. <laughs> well, I love how the two of you follow the threads. And even though it's a fairly small town, it's seven by seven, but the depth of it is infinite in the way that you have these crevices where so much history can hide. And I just love the way that you kind of both call that out of the landscape so beautifully. No, oh, um, thank you. We'll be taking questions uh, from the audience in a little bit. So I encourage you all, please drop your questions into the chat function. Uh, but before we go to that, um, I was wondering um, if you could comment on the effects that COVID, that you think COVID is having on San Francisco, um, we've seen cycles come and go that have been economic and cultural. And how do you feel like COVID may play into this? Hmm. You know, Paul, do you want you want to go first? Sure. You know, you know, it's funny is uh, you know I spend so much time as it is alone in a room doing my work. You know, as Gary was saying, like writing is a is a solitary practice. Drawing is a very solitary practice. Uh, my my balancing mechanism was always to get out and use my city, to enjoy my city. And, uh, and that has, has disappeared. So it's, it's odd because I just spend more time, as we probably all do, uh, alone in my space. So it's hard to say. Uh, I can only talk about what I hear from, from my friends in the restaurant industry or in, in the bar industry or basically service uh, or you know even the, the people uh, friends who were nurses and doctors, um, I, I do hear a lot of talk. You know people are are always asking me, oh, do you know anybody who's leaving? Anybody who's fleeing? And the truth is, I really don't know that many people. I know some people who are temporarily relocating because maybe they have another house or they have a place they can go to to, to get out of the city for a while. But in in my sphere, I'm not really hearing anyone trash San Francisco. And, and I think it's because I, I've always said that, uh, you know, San Francisco is, is not a jealous friend. Um, and it, it's not the friend that makes you show up to brunch every Sunday. You know, you can, you can, you can be friends with San Francisco and go off and have a crazy adventure. And when you come back, San Francisco says, cool, where have you been? Tell me the story. Uh, and, and doesn't give you a hard time. And I think that that relationship people have with this place is, they love it. They love it for for not just the the culture, but and not just the the landscape or the air. They love it for all those things. And and um, you know the people who who might be leaving just because they're not getting the cultural experience. Uh, and and again, I'm not talking about people who are leaving potentially for pragmatics or practicalities, because I'm sure that 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 is true and that's unfortunate. Um, I do think that on the other side, there's going to be a resurgence of hey, this was the thing, this is the thing I love about this place. Because when you miss it, you come back and, and, and you give it a, a bigger hug than if you, when you saw it every day. So uh, in a way, there's something really positive on the other side of this in my mind, and, and maybe it's just my attempt to stay optimistic, but the, the people who stay are gonna come back and they're gonna celebrate. And I think you know, arts are gonna thrive, creativity is going to thrive because really this is a creative town in so many respects. So uh, yeah, I, I have a lot of optimism. Yeah, I, I have both optimism and pessimism. Um, you know, I think that unfortunately some important people are leaving and some important institutions, places, restaurants, bars, uh, cultural institutions are going out of business and we haven't yet seen the end. We haven't come to the bottom of this um, uh, economic uh, horror show that's kind of unfolding in slow motion and that may not even have reaped its all of its victims yet. And, uh, you know, it's just unconscionable that there has been no, no stimulus package passed when people, so many people are really hanging on by a thread. I'll just give one example of somebody that's very important to the cultural life of the city who just left. Um, there's a wonderful map maker in North Beach, it's one of the real sort of classic North Beach institutions, Shine and Shine Maps, Jimmy Shine and Marty Shine. And 
them, they left, they're gone. They sold their building. Now, you know, to some degree, it's an older guy. He's been doing this a long time. He maybe was already doing more online sales, but nonetheless, you know, the COVID-19 uh, crisis pushed him over the edge. So this is a really unfortunate thing for the city. And there are plenty of places like that. Um, North Beach City Lights has been able to hang on, but, you know, let's hope that places like Vesuvio and Specs and Cafe Trieste and all these places that if they were to go out of business would be irreparable losses. I mean, these are not, they're not recoverable. They can't be replaced. Um, so, you know, I'm very worried about that, but I think that um, there's a big upside as well. Um, you know, we've seen 30% reduction in rents. Uh, and they haven't, I haven't seen anything. I've been living here 50 years. I haven't seen these kind of vacancies and it's not cheap yet. You know, it's like if things were, if it was 3,500 before for some mediocre apartment, now it's 25. It's not like it's that cheap, but it's better than 35. And um, so, and I think we, what I hear is that this will probably continue maybe through January. Uh, rents will continue to drop, vacancies will continue to rise. So there's a school of thought that we might actually see a little bit of a bohemian renaissance in San Francisco as people that could not afford the outrageous rents uh, begin to maybe come back. I mean, that remains to be seen. And some of the people that left, you know, maybe their roots were not that deeply planted in San Francisco soil. Um, they came here to make money. They came to work in, in various industries and they don't have to go in the offices, they left. You know, so be it, you know, but they, uh, uh, you know, it's unfortunate for them, but I, I think they're, they're not, the loss of that demographic is not altering the kind of old DNA of the city. And, um, and so I think there's a chance that we'll see some positive uh, bounce back from the fact that the city is getting hammered. So I think it's both, we're seeing a danger of the loss of some great institutions and places, but we could also see an opening um, to what people think of romantically, but I think rightfully is as the old San Francisco, as a place where rents were not uh, absolutely you know, absurd and you had to either be grandfathered in from a house or rent control, or this was a gated community. And that wasn't a, that was antithetical to having punk bands and language poetry and, you know, uh, abstract modern dance and, you know, all the stuff that, you know, we want in San Francisco to keep it like crazy and alive. And uh, so I think it's a, it's a moment of crisis and maybe opportunity. I think it's a really interesting time. Mm. So we have some questions. Uh, since it's Halloween, we have actually a couple of questions that address uh, places that are haunted in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. um, have you heard any actual spirit or ghost stories that you can share? <laughs> oh boy, um, let me think of places that are supposed to be haunted. I mean, there's uh, probably Anton LaVey's old house, which I think is out on um, Fulton and Willard. Um, you know, he was this Satanist so if any place is gonna be haunted, you'd think it would be that, although I haven't heard any particular stories about it. Um, there's a whole book called Haunted San Francisco by the historian Rand Richards that has a number of, of tales, but I think they're more historical. I don't know if they're like poltergeists that are knocking around now. I mean, just in my personal experience, when I lived in Bernal Heights, um, uh, Bill and Emily Harris of, of SLA fame uh, lived in a really nice house right on Presida Park. I ended up actually living on Presida Park fairly recently for a, a year. And that place, after they got busted and Patty Hearst got busted and that whole thing went down, that house didn't sell for a while. And I have a feeling that there, there may have been some people that thought, uh, I don't know about buying this house. <laughs> but um, yeah, and of course, Patty Hearst's house, her house, was on Moore Street, way down in the outer mission. And I don't know how that one did either. You know, there's a, there's a lot of strange stories. And, you know, there's an apartment on Golden Gate where Patty Hearst was kept in the closet. 
So there's a million, you know, there's a room in the Mark Twain Hotel where Billy Holiday got Holiday got set up and busted by a really bizarre narc who later on ran the FBI's CIA, the, I'm sorry, the CIA's uh, LSD program where he like, they would dose Johns with prostitutes and film the proceedings, dose them with acid. Um, and uh, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of strange sites where things have happened, but um, I'm not a big believer in, in Knox and the night, but you know, I'm, I'm prepared to entertain any, uh, any, uh, any reports of them. Paul, do you, you know of any? I'm, I'm none better than that. <laughs> <laughs> so Annie asks, how have the city's soul and aura changed with the tech boom? No, oh, Paul, you want to go first? Uh, well, it's interesting because I think I came out here sort of, I came out here in 1994 and uh, I was sort of in the very beginning of that tech boom. I'll, I'll tell about my personal experience, which is, you know, All Over Coffee was created because I love to work in cafes. I mean, that was, that was where the title came from. And, um, and especially when I first moved here, I lived in a house at one point that had 13 people in the flat, like there was no room to work there. So I would camp out in, in cafes all day long. And in the mid nineties, it was, you know, it would be a coffee house by night and at night, a lot of the places would serve uh, alcohol. There'd be, there'd be bands. It was definitely a place where I, I met people and people would hang out and you made friends there. And then you came to the, the late nineties and it was just emptied out because all the, the people that were coming to San Francisco uh, who would hang out at those cafes, now they were working in, in tech. And so a lot of, you know, that was a time when I saw a lot of artists leave, a lot of, you know, rents were going up, young people were leaving. And then <coughs> we had sort of the, the first tech bubble crash. And after that, the cafes were filled again. And then we had the advent of, of laptops and then, and, then, and then the two started merging. Uh, so, you know, we've seen, you know, I saw sort of that cafe hangout environment that was a party and, or like, you know, the guy next to you was, or was drawing, the woman next to, to him was writing poetry. And that night she was performing and the band was performing. And uh, instead, you know, everybody was sitting there on their laptops and, you know, admittedly I do the same thing, but that just to talk about how, how that's sort of changed, I'm really hesitant to bag on on the tech industry and its effect. Uh, I'm not saying that it's been great for San Francisco. I think it's homogenized it a bit and it's also sort of, it's stiffened it a bit, but that's just my personal perspective. Um, I, I do think that it's in its own right, a form of creativity. It's, it's like that the next gener this generation's version of, of you know, it, it might not be the beats, but you know, it is tech. And when, when that comes to pass, not that technology will go away, but meaning when that no longer is the dominant culture in San Francisco, um, we'll look back and we'll see it as another era of this city. And I have to say, I like that. I like that San Francisco has eras. It's almost like, it's like growing up and saying, well, I'm, I'm gonna you know, dress this way and hang out with these people now. And then six months later, you're dressing this way and hanging out with those people and listening to this music now. Um, as long as the city keeps changing and growing, then it's in effect staying true to itself. Uh, yeah, I'm going to leave it at that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I, I, I tend to agree with Paul. Um, I get exasperated, as I'm sure we all do, with some of the manifestations of uh, what often feels like a monoculture. Um, it feels just monotonous or kind of all American in a way that is of limited interest to me. Um, the kind of, of whether it's you know you call them they call them tech bros. There's this quality of they're like frat boys that make, that code, frat girls who code. Uh, just people that you know. Hey, nothing against anyone from anywhere in the country or or people that are kind of all American people coming to make money. I feel like the people that are so angry at people that want to make money are rather hypocritical. Um, you know, most people want to make money. And uh, it just so happens that the desire of sort of ordinary young people around the country to make money coincided with this uh, city that 
really had been remarkably sort of undervalued in terms of its location in the world marketplace, not just tech. Um, people make the mistake of blaming all of this on tech. Um, this is Chinese money, this is European money, it's global capital. Global capital can flow anywhere it wants in a second and it will grab what it wants when it sees anything that it perceives as being undervalued. So we're sort of part of a international capital, you know, movement. And um, yeah, there's negative consequences, no question. I mean, there's no doubt that a lot of, of, of artists, a lot of poorer people, some people of color, there was, a, there's display, the amount of displacement is actually some sometimes overstated, but there has been some displacement uh, and that's a shame and that's unfortunate. But I don't see, I mean, there's this kind of meme out there. Ed, Ed Lee did it when he like gave the Twitter tax break. I mean, I think historically that's nonsense. You know, the, this movement was far greater than, than Ed Lee uh, making, uh, you know, throwing a bone to the tech industry at a time when San Francisco had 10% unemployment. You know, people forget that, you know, at, at that time, San Francisco was like on the ropes economically. Um, you know, we had this massive national recession. So, uh, you know, just in terms of kind of experientially, like Paul was talking about, um, yeah, I mean, I see it. I see, and I live in North Beach, and, um, you know, I'll see that Washington Square is more often just like young people drinking and they're and they don't seem particularly like they're uh, they're poets writers musicians artists but you know what like if you get hung up on demanding that the demographic of your city com correspond to some romantic idea that you had from starting with Kerouac and Ginsburg and going through the hippies and then it stopped there you're you're living in a little bit in the past and um, so you don't have to like everything about it, but I think, I guess where I agree with Paul ultimately the most is that there's a kind of a this too shall pass quality about things that happen in cities. And that I think this too shall pass. And we may, when it passes, we may find that we're in a pretty big economic hole and there'll be good and bad things about that. So um, I, I, you know, some of it is just temperamental. I just refuse to allow myself to get that depressed about um, the about the advent of, of of tech in San Francisco, it's 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 a drag. Sometimes I hear the young folks braying on the rooftop, but I then I remind myself, hey, I brayed on the rooftop too. And the uh, you know, so it it's it you you try not to be become a grumpy old man. I think being a grumpy old man yelling at the kids to get off your lawn is uh, you know not where you want to be as a citizen of a city. So it's a it's a balancing act, and uh, so I'm 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 guardedly optimistic that San Francisco's spirit will survive a pretty major um, demographic shift, which it definitely has had. There's no question about that. Well, we're almost about out of time. Um, I'd like to give each of you a chance if there's anything else you would like to say. Also, I want to encourage everybody, please do buy the books. Uh, we need your support. City Lights is not out of the woods so far as COVID is concerned and the economy. Um, we're trying to survive. So every book you purchase tonight, um, it helps out. So check out the links. Um, Gary, Paul, any last words? Paul, sure. you want to go ahead. Yeah, I'll take it. Uh, first of all, thank you, Peter. And, and uh, yes, absolutely, everybody. Buy the books, buy a lot of books from City Lights. Um, I have, you know, three books with City Lights. Uh, I have, I also have another new book that's come out just in the past few weeks called Come to Light. So I tell you what, anybody who buys any of my books uh, tonight, I'm happy to go buy City Lights in the next week and sign them. So, uh, you know, if that's a little bit of encouragement to, to do it because, you know, you're, you're helping me, you're buying my books, but you're also helping City Lights and every book sale means a lot. And uh, and then you get something cool. Yeah, and I'll <clears throat> I'll make the same offer, although the, my my buy-in is considerably less. Paul lives in the Excelsior and I live about 300 yards from City Lights books, but, <laughs> but I'm totally happy to do it. Again, support not just City Lights. Uh, I know Peter agrees with this. It's, it's not a zero sum game support all 
brick and mortar bookstores. You know, if you buy your book, buy, City Lights is wonderful, but buy books from local bookstores and, and buy early and often. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, anyway, I just really, i like to thank uh, Peter and City Lights for having us and thank all of you for attending. It's really been a, an honor to, uh, to be, you know, uh, presenting at, at this fantastic civic institution and long may it live. And, uh, I'll, uh, and, and it's just been, it's been a really, really a great, great experience to uh, have this relationship with City Lights and uh, have, have this book uh, come out and uh, just enjoyed it so much. Thanks.